on The Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. Some time back, I ran across an article in The Guardian that uh, caught me as it would with the headline, the CDC, that's the Center for Disease Control, is beholden to corporation and has lost our trust. We need to start our own. What caught my eye even more was the byline. It was bylined the People's CDC. And I've wanted for a long time to understand what the People's CDC organization was all about. Now, as we move into, you know, the school year has begun around the country. A lot of people are frustrated with some of the decisions regarding COVID uh, made during the school year. So I reached out uh, to uh, the organization known as the People's CDC. And my next guest is joining me as a result of those contacts. Uh, Robert Wallace is uh, his professional uh, expertise is he has a PhD in agroecology and rural economics. He's been tracking the progression of uh, of diseases for a long, especially viruses, I think, for a long time. And I've also wanted to talk to him for quite a while because he was profiled, I believe last year it was, in the, the nation as, uh, uh, let me get this right, the unemployed epidemiologist who predicted the pandemic. For years, Rob Wallace warned that industrial agriculture could cause deadly outbreaks at a global scale. It made him an exile in his field. So without any further ado or introduction, uh, Robert Wallace, welcome to the Zero Hour. No, oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And let's start with this. I mentioned the People's CDC, and which is an organization you are involved with, uh, as well as a number of others, public health experts, scientists, healthcare workers, educators, and so on, people from all walks of life. Let's get one thing out of this the way first, Rob, if we may, which is we're not talking about disbelieving the CDC because we are anti-vaxxers or COVID deniers, right? Uh, indeed, quite the contrary. Uh, we are very much uh, a coalition of public health practitioners and scientists and health workers, uh, educators, uh, people from all walks of life. And uh, we're all about just trying to get uh, rid of COVID-19. And so we're very much uh, in some ways in the other direction of the CDC. We're uh, such believers in science and public health that we want uh, all the best uh, practices that have been brought about to be uh, applied in a way that uh, CDC, uh, which has a $12 billion a year budget and thousands of employees, has basically uh, run, run away from. Uh, so we are very much pro-vaccine, and uh, we are, in fact, very much disappointed in uh, the behavior of the CDC and the Biden administration when it comes to actually trying to get uh, vaccines into people's arms. Uh, only a, a small percentage of people uh, uh, in the U.S. have actually had more uh, than just the two uh, beginning shots. I think it's something like 35 percent uh, have had the boosters. Uh, so uh, we are very much not in the clear when it comes to making sure that everybody's vaccinated. And here's another aspect of it. Uh, 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 a quick personal story, okay, from family members who I will leave anonymous uh, for their their own privacy, but very close to me, uh, mother and and young son, four-year-old, five-year-old son, school in Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, the directive was go to school, no masks. In the first week, mother and son both got COVID after having evaded it for some two years and were immediately down with, the, you know, feeling quite sick. And of course, having to isolate from the rest of the family and the rest of the world. It, it, it struck me, you know, people were complaining beforehand. People were kind of scratching their heads. Why no masks? Why go back to school? Is this, in addition to vaccine dissemination, is this part of the problem? Uh, most definitely. Uh, uh, we very much believe in, uh, again, all the uh, public health practices are necessary to bear on the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a really wily virus. It, it doesn't just succumb to vaccination. Uh, so we very much believe in what's called the Swiss cheese model of intervention. Uh, we use different types of intervention. Each intervention is going to have its holes in it. It's going to have its problems. But if you layer a bunch of pieces of Swiss cheese, all the holes are eventually covered. So we are very much, I uh, think it's necessary to have um, a vaccination. We very much think uh, it's necessary to have uh, 
uh, mask mandates uh, when necessary. We very much believe that uh, schools need to have the proper ventilation uh, and the protections necessary. There are times when there are outbreaks in counties in which uh, students must stay home. Uh, so this is what's necessary to drive COVID-19 uh, down underneath its rate of replacement in such a way that it disappears. This is what countries did around the world, even before vaccination. Uh, countries very different from each other, not just China, but you have places like Vietnam, uh, New Zealand, Iceland. They engaged in these kind of uh, multifactorial interventions that drove the uh, outbreak, uh, at least uh, um, uh, extinct for the moment. Uh, before it roared back. So uh, those practices have been shown to be actually very effective when they're done in combination. And uh, it's really awful that we presently uh, across administrations, uh, it wasn't just the Trump administration, but now the Biden administration have uh, taken the idea that uh, the way we're going to defeat COVID-19 is by proclamation. We're just going to declare that it's over and then therefore uh, everybody else is going to be infected. Uh, and uh, it's a really a horrible situation because uh, already, as we well know, a million, more than a million Americans have been killed outright by the virus. And unfortunately, some of the numbers coming in is that so anywhere from nine to 23 million Americans are suffering from long COVID. Those are, that's the long term damage that comes from an, an acute infection uh, in, that can go for uh, many months into many years. Uh, damage, heart damage, uh, neurological damage, uh, damage to mental health. Uh, so allowing such a virus to circulate is uh, will uh, very much damage uh, the American people and uh, the country overall. Well, let's start with the fatality piece, Rob, because I, I, I must admit I've been going through some sense of cognitive dissonance as I see our elected leaders and our elected leaders who I don't want to be overly harsh about them, but they were elected on a platform of let's follow the science. Let's believe the science. That's what we were promised. And yet, and I hear that, you know, COVID's under control. I hear the president say it. I hear other people say it in Washington, here in Washington. And I go to this New York Times page pretty regularly that's a COVID tracker. And I see, well, 479 deaths in 24 hours or 1,002 deaths or, or 502 deaths. And I think, well, that's more than a 9-11 every week. And I don't get, you know, 3,000 people died in 9-11 and we changed our entire way of living. 3,000 people, more than 3,000 people may die in any given week still. And we're told the problem is over. And I, help me with the cognitive dissonance there. Right. I mean, the, the, we have the expectation that we have a government, we have things like society, in part to do to deal with exactly these kind of problems, whether it's a war or a pandemic or uh, any natural disaster. This is why we've decided to organize ourselves into a country of 300 million plus people, because we help each other and we are cognizant of the notion that the health of my, my brother and sister is related very much to my own health. Uh, so that whole notion of a social contract uh, that we will actually take care of each other because uh, our well-being is uh, very much interconnected, uh, has been, in essence, uh, we've been told uh, by two administrations running that uh, that is not the case. That, in fact, there are things that are more important than people's well-being and safety, and that is uh, getting people back to work. Uh, so, in, in uh, my vantage point is that I think uh, uh, what's considered more important is the, uh, the profit margin for the next quarter, and there's only a couple uh, going a couple years, uh, you know, putting a uh, damper on sending people to work is uh, so awful, at least from the vantage point of those who run the country, that uh, we are going to actually send people into the maw of COVID-19, whatever the damage might come about. Because you're absolutely right. Uh, we got 500 deaths a day. And this is during the uh, summer period where typically there are fewer deaths than during the winter spike that usually comes. Um, and uh, we see the uh, Biden administration stripping out all uh, efforts to protect us. All the mass mandates are gone. Uh, in fact, the people CDC uh, originated in January of this year, in part in response to the CDC's decision to basically roll down recommendations from 10 days quarantine to five days quarantine. Uh, the virus doesn't act that way, doesn't cooperate that way. It's infectious uh, beyond the five day period. 
And uh, so all these means are about uh, uh, re reducing uh, the message or, or uh, re getting rid of the message that uh, society and government is to help people. In fact, instead, it's basically organized around helping the employers and getting people back to work is what the employers want. You know, of course, the great irony to me about the name the People's CDC, which, by the way, can be found at peoplescdc.org. The great irony for me about that is that the CDC is supposed to be the People's CDC. They, it's, it was created by the government, by the public sector. It supposedly exists to do what you all are doing on a volunteer basis, uh, which it is, you know, demonstrably not doing. To me, my sense, too, is that the government, the CDC, as we, the traditional CDC, let's call it, um, is uh, deeply in bed with the pharmaceutical industry. We develop, you know, we fund the development of a vaccine and give it to the private sector to charge for. Um, you know, we could go on, you know, uh, government officials getting a percentage of certain uh, government scientists getting a percentage of certain patents and so on, having a financial interest in the relationship with the pharmaceutical companies. It just strikes me going in that we shouldn't need a people's CDC because that's what the CDC should be. Well, that's absolutely correct. I mean, that was our, our very point. I mean, uh, for us, uh, Many of us in the uh, the field of uh, public health or epidemiology, uh, we may uh, have for many decades have our clashes with the CDC, but we, uh, we respect uh, many people there. We understand that it is indeed a government agency with a, what I said was $12 billion a year. They have the, 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 you know, the capacity and the equipment and the people to actually take care of, of pandemics in a way that uh, you and I shouldn't be doing. I mean, this is the whole problem with the message of the government going, uh, it's up to you, Jack. You figure out what to do because not, n neither of us, nobody uh, is indeed uh, a CDC unto itself. I mean, this is why, again, we organize ourselves into society. We have a government. We have agencies to do the, the hard, heavy lifting when it comes to um, uh, incredibly difficult things like pandemics and climate change uh so that we were so moved uh to the point uh or that early this year we decided to found a, a people cdc is indeed exactly you're exactly right an indictment of the cdc you're absolutely right we always thought that the cdc should be the people cdc and that we are setting something up like this really underscores that the cdc is not operating uh in in our view in the people's uh interests uh and so uh we uh you know, we are, again, a, a group of volunteers. We're doing the best we can. It's an act of mutual aid. It's an act of, of trying to provide some of the services, trying to uh, model to the CDC itself what one should be doing in terms of uh, uh, helping the, the American people and people around the world to, to deal with a an insidious virus that is continuing to put people in body bags. And uh, the necessity, uh, the best way to get through a uh, such a crisis is to uh, end the uh, end the virus and and reduce the the infections instead of just pretending that we're going to have to live with it. Uh, you had me at mutual aid, by the way. But Rob Wallace, the um, one of the uh, ironies to me, I mean, it, clearly when we're talking about public health, when we're talking about epidemiology, when we're talking about addressing the spread of a, a of a sometimes deadly disease like this, uh, culture is a huge part of it, right? Society is a huge part of it, perception. And it seems to me, uh, one of the reasons why I felt it necessary to make it clear that this was not an anti-vax conversation was because it seems to me that one of the tragic things about the non-compliance in this country, the number of people who are not getting the, the needed number of vaccines, the number of people who are not masking and so on, besides the fact that they've been given bad direction uh, by the CDC, is that in fact, the lack of trust they have towards the CDC and other government institutions when they're given correct direction or guidance or advice, um, it seems to me, it, 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 the, the irony is that there's a grain of truth in the conspiratorial thinking, not that the conspiratorial thinking is correct, but that the CDC has uh, undermined its own trust with the public because even ignorant people aren't stupid. Uh, what I guess what I'm driving at is that 
people mistrust the CDC, they mistrust mask mandates or mask recommendations, they don't follow them, they're aggressive about not following them, they consider, because in fact, somewhere along the line, they may have picked up the fact that there is an overly, quote, cozy relationship between these government agencies and whether it's drug corporations or other big corporations or whatever, the tragic thing is even when they're given good advice, it's undermined by these uh, these pernicious relationships. Do you, do you get what I'm driving at? Oh, absolutely. And very much we understand that uh, public trust is an epidemiological variable, meaning uh, it, it's a major part of whether or not a virus uh, uh, will succeed or fail. And if you don't have the public trust, then it makes uh, public health incredibly difficult. And without public health, then we're down to individual decision making about a virus. And that does not beat a pandemic that's operating at a global scale. Uh, and uh, my view about it is that trust, uh, the failure of trust goes back decades. It uh, arrived with the uh, uh, emergence of the neoliberal uh, paradigm. Uh, public health has been uh, divested uh, for, for decades now. Uh, it, uh, funding for it, it was uh, in, in rapid decline uh, from the 70s on, or uh, health was basically monetized and uh, spun out to your individual relationship with your doctor. Doc medical doctors can be wonderful, but they don't, they're not in the business of public health. It's a thing's entirely different. And so uh, that uh, uh, defeat actually goes hand in glove with, uh, in, in essence, both parties deciding the uh, maybe one more than the other, it's true, but both parties basically uh, uh, making, uh, uh, basically destroying government and uh, as, a, as a form of uh, social good, as a means by which uh, uh, interventions and, and assistance can be made to help people in, under difficult circumstances. And I think the American people got the message. Um, not only that their government has abandoned them, but it, it actually turned into an ide ideology to be celebrated. And so you have the really awful moment of millions of people who have been abandoned, who, in essence, engaged in a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of traumatic bonding, meaning a, a sort of stock, uh, Stockholm syndrome of embracing uh, the very damage that has been directed to them. And I understand it's a, it's a way, an attitude that one has to take in order to survive from day to day uh, once the, the government that uh, you put trust in has abandoned you. So uh, and in this way, we, we view... Um, uh, the, the refusal to take vaccines uh, and to be vaccinated as, as a failure in vaccine access as well, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the government is required. That, that is its job is to try to convince the American people to, uh, to be vaccinated. And then what that involves is, uh, is, is hiring a million people in a, in a jobs corps program to go door to door or farm to farm. Uh, both in urban areas and rural areas, and and talk to people. And the first 17 times, you know, uh, Farmer Joe or your neighbor down on uh, 122nd Street is going to slam a door on on those uh, uh, job court people because they they disagree with it. But it's the necessity to try to build trust, have a conversation, maybe a few words through the door, and you start to build that trust in such a way that you can have a uh, try to get more people vaccinated. And, you know, it so also would be a wonderful way to check in on people. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, at People CDC, we are uh, in favor of sheltering place when necessary, but it's not in, in the interest of locking people in their homes and throwing the keys away. It's a, it's just a momentary uh, uh, intervention so we can get through the worst of the pandemic in such a way that we can get people out back on the streets without having to wear masks as quickly as possible. And when we don't have that trust and, and, and uh, or if we do sheltering, sheltering in place, without checking in on people, that's where a lot of the damage also accrues in other ways because people are people and they like to be with other people. And it's a it's a beautiful thing. And we want to be able to get out uh, from underneath that, get people back uh, out in the street and the parades and all in the, in the ballpark because uh, it's a, a wonderful thing about being alive uh, to be with other people. Uh, but it is also very important to make sure that people aren't, aren't killed by this virus. And we don't want a million plus people killed. We didn't have to do it this way. And I think uh, the administration presently deciding that uh, it's all over and washing its hands of it, knowing full well of the of the damage that COVID is accumulating is really uh, unforgivable. And well, let's explore the counter argument. Again, we're talking with Rob Wallace of People CDC. Let's explore the counter argument, which is, first of all, I need to break this out in two to do that. But the counter argument uh, would be, well, we can't continue indefinitely to mask, 
to vaccinate, to do all these things, because people die when the economy suffers, people die, uh, children's uh, education is hampered if they can't go to school and that type of thing. So at some point, we just have to get back to the business of living. That would be the counter. That still doesn't excuse the deception. In other words, if, if someone wants to make that argument, they if the administration or anyone else wants to make that argument, they should make that argument and let the people react, which they're not doing. But but that said, I think, uh, you know, we saw it uh, among the Republicans during the Trump administration. Uh, this administration won't articulate it, but it may be that they're thinking, uh, well, political considerations aside, uh, life has got to go on. And what do we say to that? argument sure i mean uh you know the best way to deal uh with getting people back into the you know uh out into the restaurants and ballparks and having a good time and back at the lake and all those things uh is to end the virus is to end the pandemic uh so if you uh started off come you know uh march 2020 uh i mean this is i mean this is a really sick compensatory fantasy but a notion of of a donald trump uh, who actually steps to the mic and takes it seriously and actually engages in all the swiss cheese interventions that we talked about uh i mean a vaccine took until the end of the year but you could have done shelter in place you could have mailed people masks you could have done the job core program all those things uh, that other countries did that basically drove the pandemic to a, a local uh, extinction and allow people back on the street I remember at the time in like May 2020, you had uh, people uh, back in New Zealand out into the rugby parks uh, without masks, you know, because there was no virus or even people in other countries, uh, you know, back of the rave, having a good time because the virus was not there anymore. I mean, if you want to get back to, to life, if there's an urgency of normalcy, then let's get rid of the virus so we can back to the streets. Um, but pretending that the virus isn't happening is not a return to a normalcy. I mean, talk about cognitive dissonance. That is, you are walking around prepared for the deaths to continue at a rate of 500 a day and uh, allowing long COVID to hit millions of Americans around you uh, in such a way that uh, pretending that that's not happening is not normal. That would be not follow as a, a diagnosis of, of normal. Uh, and, you know, the irony is in that in the course of doing that, you're doing damage to your economy. I mean, uh, there was a report that came out last week that one in three unfilled jobs are due to long COVID. So <laughs> there's a secret and uh, it's a terrible thing that it's a secret, but millions of Americans are going down with long COVID in such a way that uh, uh, we start to see the uh, that what normalcy involves is is not going to be the same as a, a kind of pre-pandemic normal. Well, and yet uh, the latest I've heard from the government is and the CDC is a suggestion that we are now facing a future where COVID-19 will be permanent. Um, no, in effect, the message being, well, you'll get a vaccine every year like you do for the flu. So basically, the message that, that we're hearing from the government, as I perceive it anyway, is ah, it's, it, it's, it's like a flu now. You'll get your shot every year and life will go on. Right. Well, we're back to, uh, you know, in, in 2020, uh, Donald Trump and uh, Boris Johnson were ridiculed for trying to uh, pretend that COVID-19 is exactly like flu. And two years later, we circle back to having the Biden administration take that exact argument. Uh, COVID-19 is not the flu. Uh, even a mild case can do considerable damage. And uh, the damage is accruing in the thousands of, uh, uh, a day. And it's not something that one can just flick aside. Uh, it, if we are, have any notion of a uh, society that uh, is indeed uh, cares about uh, life and living and, and people's well-being, uh, this is certainly uh, the, uh, the intervention necessary to, to uh, undertake. Um, and if indeed COVID-19 is going to be here uh, for us for a while, it isn't necessarily that it's going to evolve into a kind of uh, stasis the way we've been able to do with flu for the most part, right? You get your seasonal flu shot every year. Right. And if, even if you are infected, it, it's a bad uh, week or so. A uh, bad uh, case of COVID-19 is nothing to say, uh, like that. Uh, it's been showing an incredible capacity for evolution. Uh, every two months now, you have a new uh, uh, Omicron subvariant that emerges and takes over. Uh, it's, and uh, it, it has a lot to play with. Uh, there's anywhere from five to seven million people uh, are infected 
uh, every week worldwide. So in essence, uh, you have COVID-19 uh, allowed to experiment with all sorts of different kind of molecular adaptations that allow it to st uh, stay ahead of our herd immunities that we develop and our vaccines. So uh, there's no, uh, it's, it's not necessarily so that our vaccines will be able to cover uh, COVID-19 and the virus itself is, is has pl uh, plenty of playroom to evolve out from underneath it and continue to be a virulent pathogen. Well, let me ask you another question, Rob, uh, and it's a serious question. Uh, all of this is com feels completely right, sounds completely right, uh, cognitively, processes, scans is completely right. I don't doubt any of it, but I, in certainly at moments and a lot of times, I would say, I wonder if it's too late for this society. Have we let this go on? And I should inject at least one note of optimism or possible optimism. It seems to me the only way we can convince non-compliers to comply with this is by beginning with the honesty you guys are offering which is, yes, it has been a corporatized pro a process, it has been a politicized process, you haven't always been told the straight truth, we're sorry about that, but this is what's really going on, this is what we really need to do. In my positive moments, I think, well, you know, maybe we could do that, but I, wor I do worry, I have to be honest, that I just think this society is too far gone maybe to receive that message. Uh, it is, uh, you're absolutely right, it's a terrible historical moment. It is. Uh... Uh, and there are, are is a long uh, explanation for this. I'll try to make it short, but big picture, post-World War II, uh, it was an American moment. Uh, in the, the words of the kind of uh, some of the uh, geographers, we were on a kind of a, uh, a spike up. We were uh, uh, moving from turning uh, a money into capital and building empire. Uh, and we seem to be on the far side of that uh, cycle of accumulation. Uh, we're now turning, uh, those who run the country are helping turn capital into money, meaning we're cashing out, meaning the billionaires are taking the uh, lots of cash and putting it in, uh, whether it's um, uh, Cayman Islands or South Dakota, they are storing their money away, right? And uh, the, the grand project uh, of the United States is being uh, picked off bit by bit and sold away. Uh, and so things like public health are, are, are money suckers, meaning they, they're not in the business of enriching the, the rich. They are right. about helping the American people. And that's, uh, those are projects that cost money. And we're deciding not to, to invest in them uh, in such a way that uh, that whole thing goes away. And there's a lot of uh, ideological and uh, media attention on, ex on rationalizing that, saying, that those things are, are not helpful, we need to move away from that, and that uh, those big projects, uh, say perhaps, perhaps for uh, invading other countries, all those big projects are now are, are to be sold off, and, 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 and the whole idea of, an, uh, of America is, is to be uh, um, moved away from. And uh, so it is a terrible historical moment that we've arrived at the spot, and uh, the only thing we can do it in this uh, spot is to actually to do their best we can to push back, uh, to make these arguments uh, along the lines of uh, no, actually allowing a, a deadly pathogen to circulate is not good for us. No, pretending that it's not there is not good for us. And to try bit by bit, uh, work on uh, the argument and try to get people back into uh, the notion of a, of a trust for a uh, society that actually is uh, taking care of, of them and their needs when they need them. Uh, nobody's interested in, in counting how many socks you have in your drawer. That's your business. But big picture and the things that um, we all need uh, in terms of uh, helping each other out, uh, that those things, whether it's uh, this COVID-19, it won't be the, the last uh, pandemic virus. There are many others that are circulating out there that are potential candidates, whether it's the avian influenza, the swine influenza, the African swine fever, some of the Ebola's. Uh, uh, NIPA virus, there are still viruses that are capable to be able to go uh, uh, pandemic. And I, I don't know about you, I don't want to go through this again. Uh, so that's why I'm very much in favor of having a healthy public health that would keep this uh, any such viruses uh, from really getting a, a foothold uh, the way that uh, COVID-19 got a foothold in, in the U.S. in in the beginning of 2020. And, you know, I was born into the last generation to be exposed to polio. 
And uh, I still, first of all, as I recall, uh, Jonas Salk donated his, his, his vaccine and uh, didn't try to profit off it. But secondly, I still remember in elementary school, it was a great national adventure to get vaccinated. It, we were all in it together, right? I mean, whatever other divisions we had, there was a sense of com communality uh, among the people of the, and I feel that we're also suffering the side effects of this. And, and, uh, Rob, if you have one more minute, I do want to just um, point out that, uh, quote you, a pandemic may now be all but inevitable in what would be a catastrophic failure on the part of governments and health ministries world, worldwide. Millions may die. You said that in 2007. Um, and by the way, right around that time, I was part of a kind of war gaming exercise and I was not as prophetic as you, but you know, we knew this could happen, a kind of war gaming, how it might go through, how it might occur if we had a pandemic. Now it's happened. Do you have a, I guess, a personal question? Do you have a sort of sense, a Cassandra-like sense of, you know, being uh, the prophet nobody listens to or what? Yeah, it's not, uh, it's an occupational hazard. Uh, I'm not the only one who suffers it. Uh, there are epidemiologists uh, who've been crying out on this for decades, all very different political stances. Uh, I'm more on the left, but there have been uh, centrists and rightists who've been worried about this. This is very much a, uh, across the political spectrum, epidemiologists have been up at night worried about this. And uh, I mean, it's such a clear and present danger that one would have expected that uh, uh, the richest country in the history of humanity would have been prepared. It seemed like we were prepared, but in fact, indeed, uh, you know, it, it isn't just a merely a matter of how much money CDC gets. It has to do with many of the topics that we described today, uh, where we are in our cycle of accumulation, where we are as a culture, and where we are in terms of our decision to be a society. And uh, that is not in a good spot presently. So, uh, and it's a wonder that uh, pandemic uh, here would be sign enough and signal enough for us to change our act. But instead, it's uh, unfortunately at this present moment, it's been a sign and signal to double down and pretend uh, it's not happening. Uh, that might change upon a, uh, another winter spike uh, when we've cleared out all uh, prevention uh, uh, policies at this point. Uh, fingers crossed it doesn't come to that. We hope that COVID goes away, but we're uh, very uh, also uh, respectful of a virus that is infecting 5 million people and evolving on, on a two-month cycle. Um, I'll just say that, uh, to end here, if that's all right, uh, that you know we very much encourage uh, people to uh, find, uh, if, you, if you're not getting what you need from the CDC, uh, you can try to at least get some of what you need from the people CDC. Uh, you can go to our website. Uh, we've got a uh, weather report that comes out uh, uh, every week about the state of, of COVID, including maps that you can see about what the actual danger and exposure is in your county. Uh, we've got a 15-minute uh, uh, a uh, COVID This Week report. You can find on our YouTube uh, channel. We've got a urgency of equity toolkit for uh, parents uh, sending their students back to school about what's necessary to make sure that they're safe and that the uh, parents and then their households are safe. And there are a variety of other uh, uh, tools and, uh, and uh, um, documents and uh, that could be a very helpful for, for people trying to figure out what they need to do in a time in which the CDC and the Biden administration have basically said, it, uh, you're on your own, Jack. Oh, well, you're doing fantastic work, and I, I very much appreciate it. I, I uh, encourage people to visit uh, peoplecdc.org. And Rob, I hope we get the chance to talk again sometime soon. Rob Wallace. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. We'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is, this is your all hour.